If I ask you to picture a landscape, the first image that pops into your mind might look like this one, or it might look like this one. If it's the latter, you aren't wrong. But the image that you call to mind is evidence of a deep cultural bias regarding the landscape that dates back over 100 years. The ideological atmosphere in America during the latter half of the 19th century was charged with a renewed interest in the intellectual and aesthetic ideals of Romanticism, a movement that had originated in Europe over a century prior. Romanticism emphasized sensory experience and imagination and reached its pinnacle in the built landscape where it manifested as naturalistic compositions contrasting pastoral lawns with a sublime untamed woodland and drew directly and deliberately from the aesthetics and techniques of landscape painting. Romanticism promoted the idea that the human mind was able to have an emotional, almost instinctive response to the natural landscape, and this provided an appealing narrative to a young, impressionable America. During this period, about the same time that Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox were designing the iconic Central Park, a fervent nationalism was building around the diverse and far-flung landscapes of North America. Rail made tourism broadly accessible, and so people frequently traveled to see these impressive wilderness landscapes for themselves. Landscape painters, most notably of the Hudson River School, documented this vast, sublime American wilderness, which was already coming under threat, taking artistic license to infuse their work with their own dramatic flair. These paintings were widely collected and served to promote conservation of the indigenous landscape of North America. Their popularity ultimately led to the establishment of our national park system. This imagery galvanized a relatively young nation behind these natural landscapes, linking the new country to a much older geologic history, putting the American legacy on par with the classical history of Europe. There's an indisputable and dynamic relationship between the romantic style of these landscape paintings and the picturesque aesthetic of landscape gardening in America during the same period. Evidence of this dialogue is tangible at Olana, the historic estate of Frederick Edwin Church, one of the most well-known painters of the Hudson River School. Church owned nearly 200 acres, and while a good part of his property was dedicated to farming, he very intentionally designed the landscape of his estate as if he were composing a landscape painting. Equally significant is the fact that Church was implementing his landscape design at Olana contemporaneously with Olmsted's and Vox's work at Central Park. Church and Olmsted were actually well acquainted, and in 1871, Church was appointed commissioner of Central Park, heartily endorsed by Olmsted. When you look at Church's paintings, and then visit Olana, and then Central Park, you can clearly see the cross-pollination of ideas. Yet while traditions in landscape painting continued to evolve throughout the 20th century, the picturesque style of landscape gardening experienced a sort of arrested development, perhaps because this style arose in America at the same time that the profession of landscape architecture was formally defined. Regardless, I think this has resulted in a contemporary understanding of landscape frozen in its late 19th century definition a cultural preference for the designed landscape to be naturalistic and picturesque, reinforced in large part by the proliferation of naturalistic landscape imagery throughout popular culture. This distinctly American landscape imagery, which originated in landscape painting, but quickly became part of popular culture in the form of postcards and promotional posters, carried from churches in Olmsted's day into the 20th century. It became essentially propaganda for domestic tourism. These Works Progress Administration era posters of the late 1930s and 1940s sold the American landscape to our citizenry with great success. The national parks were premier vacation spots and delivered what was promised, mirroring, 50 years later, scenes from 19th century romantic landscape paintings. People came in droves to view these sublime natural landscapes, to experience the greater order of nature, and to bring it home with them in the form of an image. Around the same time period, Americans were smitten with what had become a more broadly accessible pastime, amateur photography. 
Kodak made 37 editions of the book How to Make Good Pictures. This is the edition from 1938. And like the WPA posters of the same time period, it's a marketing piece. Kodak published this manual to sell its cameras and multiple varieties of film. But what this manual also did was tell its readers how to see. In its multiple chapters instructing how to successfully capture desirable images, manuals like this one reinforced the idea of a landscape as scenery. It covered topics like composition, lighting, and how to shoot distant landscapes. The example images in the manual have a striking resemblance to the painted and printed landscapes we've just looked at. When these enthusiastic tourists got home, their impulse was to recreate nature in their own front yards. A garden encyclopedia from 1948 might be the kind of DIY resource they'd turn to, complete with entries on accent plants, images demonstrating how shade trees offer a delightful contrast to the patches of sunlight that play on the velvety grass. And my favorite, the entry for naturalizing, that suggests achieving the elusive irregularity of the natural world by tossing up a basket of potatoes and then planting a tree or shrub where each potato has landed. In the event that this project of naturalizing your home became too labor-intensive, you needn't despair. This was America. New yard machines turned work into play. Riding lawnmowers and electric hedge clippers meant more time for leisure. And while you were saving time, why not mow your lawn in luxury with man's power mower? Complete with an air-conditioned cockpit, the Wonder Boy X100 made it possible to manicure nature without actually having to participate in nature at all. And it was so easy and comfortable, even the lady of the house could use it. Now, I haven't been able to find evidence that the Wonder Boy made it past the prototyping stage. But I do think that making a built landscape look like a painting of a landscape is a dangerous undertaking. With the best of intentions, our cultural preference for the picturesque results in a general disregard for the underlying cultural meaning and ecological infrastructure that is essential to making a built landscape sustainable and enduring. (laughs) 